So tell me a little bit about who Stephen Bain is. <laughs> I grew up in Emmett. I uh, graduated from high school in 1972. Uh, ser served an LDS mission in Brazil. I went to school at Utah State for a couple of years, actually one year. Um, got married, started a dairy. My wife and I have eight children, 28 grandchildren. Uh, I've been interested in the principles of good government since I was 15 years old. So I never intended to run for office, however. What got you so interested at 15? No, an idea came to my head, and the question was, what would an ideal society look like? So I started studying history on my own, mostly, to try to figure out what an ideal society looked like. And I came up with three basic uh, criteria. One, it had to be a prosperous society, and prosperity is a function of work. So uh, Adam Smith said in The Wealth of Nations that uh, everyone could become prosperous if they engaged in productive work. Prior to that time, it was based on a theory that wealth was finite. So the only, if you didn't have wealth, the only way you could take it was to go to war and get it. So that's one of the causes of violence in the, old, in the, in the ancient world. Uh, Adam Smith's philosophy of uh, productive work really has increased uh, prosperity throughout the world, which interestingly came, was published the same year that the Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776. The second point is uh, uh, an ideal society would be family-centered meaning a lot of the responsibilities for uh, health care, food, clothing, shelter, uh, transportation would be family-centered. So we need to build the capacity of families to solve their own problems, which we have not done in the modern world. In fact, that's one of the main reasons that I've been running, is trying to say we're not talking about the right things. The third thing is we can't allow elites, because elites always get themselves in positions of power, to use the power of government to make decisions for other people. One of the prices of, of freedom is that you have to let people that uh, you don't think are necessarily capable to make decisions, make decisions, and they need to be able to experience the consequences of those decisions. That's how wisdom is gained. So on all those counts, um, uh, we haven't done real well. And going off of that, you know, you talk about being family-centric. You talk about prosperity and kind of a sense of balance in a way. Um, how does that go into what your top priorities would be if you were to be reelected? So. If, if we were to have a serious discussion in politics, which we're not having right now, and hopefully we will, we should be asking, well, how do you increase the number of responsible or economically self-sufficient families? Well, families are basically, they, they build themselves. You can't pass laws to, to have families do the right thing. That's not how it works. But families build themselves with two building blocks. One of them is, you know, love and affection, and the other is responsibility. So as families take responsibility uh, over providing their own livelihood or maybe to see that their kids are educated, then it gives them a sense of purpose and they strengthen themselves. So when it comes to, uh, to legislative priorities, I've always focused on education because that's a major family responsibility. And right now, too many people believe it's the state's responsibility to, to, to provide the education. Uh, and I'm saying, no, it's the parent's responsibility to access the education system. So the education system should give parents choices so they can access it on their terms. 
And that's what we're, we've been moving toward, what I've been trying to do for 16 years. With the Advanced Opportunities Program, allows students to take dual credit classes, AP tests, career technical education uh, exams and, and workforce training so that they can access it on their terms. Last year we, uh, we passed a bill that I wrote that said uh, parents could choose an alternative curriculum which uh, is being used in the Emmett School District so that we can have a different government class this next fall that, that goes into more of the traditional uh, understanding of what the Founding Fathers were thinking at that time. And uh, the one this year, it rewards motivated students. It's called the Self-Directed Learner Bill. And so all of those bills allow parents or students to access the system on their terms if they take responsibility. So that's how it plays out. And it'll play out in poverty programs or uh, health care also, but I haven't had time to really work on those yet. What would you say are your other priorities? Uh, uh, poverty. I think we need to uh, work on the food stamp program uh, to help people who are coming off food stamps to actually get to a point where they're, uh, uh, you know, because you come off food stamps about 146% of federal poverty level and we need to help them get up to 180 or 200 percent of federally poverty level so that they can really uh, survive and, and thrive on their own. The other is health care. You know, a lot of people are talking about property tax and different things, but we're spending uh, oh, probably a billion to two billion dollars more as a state than we need to on health care uh, because it's designed as a sickness system where a lot of care is being taken care of in hospitals rather than a prevention system. So those are the, the other two major things, but there's a, a lots of little things that can be done uh, bes besides those big ones. And what would you say were kind of your picks, picks and peaks of this legislation's legislative session? Do you think there was anything, I know you said the self-directed learner bill, that's something that you're quite proud of, proud of. Was there anything that you didn't see passed that you wanted to? Uh, I would have liked to have seen a, a more robust discussion on, uh, on uh, an education savings account. Uh, I didn't think the discussion or the bill that was written really got into the issue very well. Uh, but that, that's the only one, and I'm not so sure we were ready this, this session to pass that bill, but I just didn't feel like it was... Uh, the people that testified in favor of it were very critical of public education, which I didn't think was necessary, and those that were opposed to it were very critical of parents, which I didn't think was necessary. So another thing that I'm trying to do is saying, we need to have a reasonable discussion on what's best not what we think ideologically aligns with what our belief systems. And so I call that uh, seeking for, you know, the reality or natural law. Uh, another high point of the session was the K-3 literacy funding bill. Now, a lot of people see that, that bill and they say it provided money for all-day kindergarten. Uh, and while it did that, there's another aspect of that bill that people don't realize and that is schools, in order to access half of the funds, have to perform and students have to be proficient in order to get those funds. So that's the first time we've ever uh, basically linked funding to, to performance. And I think that will have a, a long-term positive impact. It made, uh, it's making the education system uneasy, but they'll be fine. They'll figure it out. <laughs> it's quite a helpful point of view. Oh yeah, they'll figure it out. And then, you know, what are some issues that you kind of talked about uh, health care and poverty? Do you think those are major issues that you would like to see the legislative session address next year if you're reelected? And is there any others that you think need to be addressed by the legislature that aren't? 
Yeah, I, those are the two main issues. Now, uh, when it comes to health care, um, you don't pass a law because a lot of people think you can pass a law and everything's going to get fixed. It's more like a series of dominoes. You have to do one thing that leads to, to the ability to do another thing, which leads to the ability to do a third thing. And so there's not much appreciation by, or, or a vision by uh, people to see what the first step is and how it leads to the second and third. So the first step, well, there's two or three steps that can be taken at the same time when it comes to health care. Uh, but one of them is we need to see the state health insurance plan for state employees as a real tool. One of the, its problems is we're funding based upon employed state employees, not covered state employees. The difference is it costs about $12,500 to, to insure a per, per employee, but not all employees are insured. So what's the real cost? Is it fourteen, fifteen, sixteen thousand? I don't know what that real cost is. So we need to go back and say, we're, we're only going to fund those that want the health insurance. I think it's a, it's a disservice to say we're spending this much per employee, which is true, but we're spending a lot more per covered employee. And that's a problem because when it comes to the teachers wanting to join the state plan, the school districts have to include the bus drivers, the janitors, people that already have health insurance, and, and so it, it's driving up the cost way more than, than, than what they can afford. So that's one of the issues. Another issue that we need to do, which this could be done easily, is uh, for elective surgeries and lab work, we ought to negotiate a cash price, which is usually about 50% than if you put it through the insurance company. Well, that would save us tens and tens of millions of dollars. We're not doing some very obvious things. Uh, and that's just a couple of examples. When you saw the new districts, and you saw that you were going to another incumbent, who I'm sure you probably worked with, what was your reaction and you know, what are your thoughts moving forward? Um, well, I was disappointed, but uh, just move ahead. Ten years plus six in the house. Exactly, and it put you in a different district. Um, you know, how do you feel you're going to, you know, best represent this new group of people? Well, uh, I'm the chairman of the Senate Education Committee. I've been working for 16 years to try to uh, empower parents and make the working environment in public schools better for teachers. 16 years ago when I started this process, um, Republicans didn't want to be involved in education. So I've been pretty lonely. Now the last three or four years, now a lot of people are saying, well, we need to do something about public education. So Eagle, which is uh, the, the new part of my district, uh, they're very interested in education and they're very interested in the role of parents in education. So I think I can represent them better than any other legislator in the state of Idaho when it comes to that issue. And going back to your background, I mean, your background is in education and in agriculture. Do you think that fits well with this new district that you're going to be representing? Absolutely. Yeah, the uh, Jim County area is, uh, has a lot of agriculture in it, and education is important to almost everyone in the whole district. So. Uh, I think these are issues that resonate with everyone. And, you know, with the growing population of Idaho in general, you know, I think education, kind of like you talked about, is going to be something that we're going to be dealing with, especially as schools are currently being rebuilt. Um, do you think that your leadership, if reelected, would help support that new demand and that new growth in your district? Well, I do. But, uh, you know, like I said, when I was 15, I tried to figure out what an ideal society looked like. 
And so I spent the next 40 years you know, studying history and different things, just looking for clues. Quite often it was for clues that, were never, that weren't there. So what, what haven't we tried? Because <laughs> uh, some things we've never tried and we need to. So I, I think outside the box. And I've been told that in the next 10 years we need to build a, another 108 new schools. Well, that's if you use the current paradigm. I think there's a, another paradigm that's, that's emerging. It's called the micro school movement, where a micro school, it would be associated with a public school, so you'd have funding, but you wouldn't necessarily need to go to a, a school building to do it. You could go to a library, girls and boys club, a church, somebody's home that had a room where 15 kids could get together. You'd have an aid between the aid and, the, and some online uh, resources, or, or maybe not. Uh, you know, there's lots of different ways that this could look. And so I don't think we need to build as many elementary schools if, if we fund these micro schools. And what do you think sets yourself apart from your other two candidates going into this primary? There's two other Republicans. You know, what sets you apart from them? And why would you be the best pick? So the one I don't know. I've never met her, and uh, just some people have said that she was in support of, some, you know, medical marijuana or something. So I, I have no idea what what uh, uh, can't really comment on her. My other candidate, or my other my other opponent, he's an accountant, and he does uh, he's a tra traditional Republican. He works on taxes and budgets, which traditionally Republicans do. I'm a Republican that's worked on education the whole time I've been here, 16 years. And uh, I'm harder to replace than he is. Why would you say that? All Republicans work on budgets and, and uh, taxes. That's what Republicans do. Republicans don't work on education. In fact, a lot of the Republicans that are working on education, not all of them, but many of them, their, their idea of improving education is to make it easier for people to leave the public school system. Okay? That's what they want to do. And so that's what their proposals are. All of my proposals, though, though I'm not opposed to having the money follow the child, my proposals have worked about giving choice within the public education system. No one else does that. No one else does that in Idaho. No one else does that in the nation. I'm the only one. Is there anything that you want to make sure the voters understand about who you are as an elected official? Yeah. Uh, I, I would like to say something. I. Uh, I came over here 16 years ago not knowing exactly how to go about what I wanted to do because I, you know, I hadn't exactly defined that either. But we started going down the I knew it, I wanted to work in the public education realm because that's a parental responsibility. And 170 years ago, Horace Mann said the state should be responsible to choose the curriculum. And I disagreed with that. I said, we need to change that. So I've been trying to change the public education system so that uh, it was more parent friendly, which is really popular right now. <laughs> but also, I did this without the support of the uh, right wing in Idaho. I did it without the support of the Education Association, you know, the teachers union. I've done it without the support of the uh, of the uh, State Board of Education. Tom Luna, when he was in, was supportive, so it did have some support there. Uh, but basically, the reason I was able to get these things passed isn't because I'm brilliant, but because they were good ideas. I was trying to figure out what was the best, what would empower students. But uh, it's been a lonely battle. I'm really glad to see other people starting to see we need to I turn parents loose. Uh, so I've always been the same. 
I'm not going to change. I'll still work on, you know, working within the public education system uh, to make it better for parents, but also for teachers and students. The self-directed learner bill uh, I designed when I was substitute teaching at Emmett Middle School. And I said, we need to reward these students that are doing well. Because they would get their work done in 10 or 15 minutes, and they were stuck in the class. I said, we need to reward them. We need to reward what we want. And uh, if we can improve the inv working environment for teachers, it will cut down on uh, bur teacher burnout, teacher stress, uh, education will get better. So th the most important bill that I've written is the self-directed learner bill. And because it hasn't really taken effect yet, it won't take effect until July 1st, people won't really see what that will do for about another three years. But they'll see that when you reward what you want, you get more of it. <laughs> so uh, the, the other thing about me is I'm, I'm a moderating influence. I'm not prone to make, uh, you know, radical statements, though I do challenge everyone's thinking 